Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today for the committee's oversight hearing on a topic important to our aging population, social adult daycare programs. Seniors are the fastest growing age group in this city. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the population of individuals aged 65 and older increased from 35 million to 49.2 million in the last 16 years. Today, older adults represent about 13% of the city's total population. They are caregivers, they are volunteers, and they have contributed so much to New York City. They deserve to know that the programs available to them are safe and appropriate to their needs. Social Adult Daycare Programs, or SACs, are one of these important services. SACs offer seniors who are functionally impaired with health services, meals, appropriate social activities, and transportation service. Social adult daycares also provide needed relief to caregivers who need this time to take care of personal matters. In fiscal year 2018, the Department for the Aging, also known as DIPTA, oversaw 10 social adult daycares in the city. The council has strived to make sure that these social adult daycares are safe for our seniors. In 2015, the city council passed local law nine, my bill to regulate SAG's program that do not receive any funding from the state or city. This law was to make sure that even those social adult daycares that do not receive grants, funding still need to meet certain standards and requirements in order to operate. At the end of last session, we also introduced 1278A, which required DIPTA to create and maintain a public database of all social adult daycare that are registered with the department. This database will include information about SACs that are important to our older population, including any notices of violation the SACs have received. Today, we will continue the ongoing dialogue about the states of the social adult daycare in New York City. We will first discuss intro 411, my bill which require Department for the Aging to inspect and report on social adult daycares and senior centers that provides meals. This bill, which require inspectors from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to provide annual inspection to any social adult daycare that handles food, will ensure that all adult daycares are handling food properly and safely. The committee will also discuss proposed intro 399A sponsored by Councilmember Paul Vallone. This bill will require DIPTA to provide a yearly report regarding the program services and activities of all neighborhood and innovative senior centers. It will provide the public with more information about how our senior centers are run and allow legislators, legislators to identify ways that we can improve these services. Today, we will hear from the Department for the Aging and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's advocates and other interested stakeholders about the social adult daycares available in the city, what services they offer, how they are budgeted and maintained, and what must we be done to improve both social adult daycares and senior centers. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing our policy analysts, Emily Rooney and Kalima Johnson, our councils, Caitlin Fahey and Newsart Choudhury, uh, uh, and finance analyst, Daniel Krupp. And I'd like to thank the uh, other members of the committee who have joined us today. We have Councilmember Rose, uh, Councilmember Ayala, Councilmember uh, Diaz, Councilmember Deutsch, Councilmember Vallone and Councilmember Eugene. So we will now hear from Councilmember Vallone, who is sponsoring proposed intros 399A, a local law requiring DIFTA to report on senior centers. Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. 
The core of DIFTA's services portfolio is the agency's citywide network of 246 contracted senior centers, frequently providing educational programs, congregate and home delivered meals, recreational programming, along with a variety of essential services, which truly speak to the importance of these centers and the population they serve. Yet as of today, there are growing concerns about the declining senior center utilization rate and the growing number of social adult daycare programs citywide, which may be attracting seniors who would otherwise attend senior centers. This is why I introduced intro 399A, which calls on the Department for Aging to report on a variety of metrics, including services, costs, utilization rates, reimbursement costs, occupancy costs, total number of employees, and salary costs, just as a few to mention of the annual attempt Madam Chair and I have gone through during budget negotiations and legislation uh, proposals as to the information that our constituents and our seniors continually ask for, not just for greater transparency, but also for a better understanding and the hope that we can help adequately provide essential services to the populations that need it most. We will work hard and hand in hand to make sure our seniors are not forgotten by creating and utilizing these programs and properly shaping and conducting outreach from DIFTA and several great organizations through our city. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I look forward to our testimony today on these bills. Thank you, Councilmember Bello. And now, um, in accordance with the rules of the council, um, our council will now administer uh, the affirm affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good morning, Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging Committee. I'm Karen Resnick, Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department for the Aging. From DIFTA, I'm joined by Dr. Robin Fenley, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Healthcare Connections, and Karen Taylor, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Community Services. Today also, I am joined by Otis Pitts, Assistant Commissioner for the Division of Environmental Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of DIFTA Commissioner Donna Corrado, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on social adult daycare, as well as on um, intro 399A in relation to requiring DIFTA to report on senior centers. DOHMH will testify this morning on intro number 411 in relation to food safety inspections for social adult day care and senior centers and reporting. Formal opportunities to ensure that the growing population of older adults are actively engaged in community life comes in many forms. During the past few years, New York City has witnessed the proliferation of social adult daycare, SADC, programs, which contract with managed long-term care companies. Social adult daycare is a structured program of socialization for individuals whose physical and cognitive needs are beyond their ability to independently participate in activities, such as that which could be found at senior centers or other community programs for older adults. Social adult daycare programs provide structured and supervised activities, meals, some personal care assistance, monitoring of overall well-being, and as optional services, transportation or case coordination. DIFTA currently oversees nine social adult daycare programs that are supported by council discretionary funding. The availability of Medicaid financing through the MLTCs has fostered the continual growth of new social adult day sites throughout the five boroughs, most notably in Brooklyn and Queens. As of today, 350 sites have registered, 142 in Brooklyn, 134 in Queens, 33 in Manhattan, 26 in the Bronx, and 15 in Staten Island. Managed long-term care companies are funded by the New York State Department of Health Medicaid program to coordinate and provide community health care services, which include social adult daycare. As part of the Medicaid program, New York State Department of Health has taken steps to ensure these services are provided to eligible individuals in accordance with New York State regs and standards. New York State Department of Health requires that MLTCs conduct initial and annual site visits of all of their contracted SADCs in order to monitor compliance with the minimum state regulations and requirements 
including the New York State Office for the Aging Social Adult Day Standards. MLTCs are mandated to assess the cognitive and physical status of all potential SADC participants prior to authorizing attendance. Further, MLTCs are to ensure SADC compliance with all related audits, as well as maintain documentation of such compliance. Additionally, New York State Department of Health requires that all MLTC contracted SADCs self-certify annually with the New York State Office of the Medicaid Inspector General, attesting that they are in compliance with the NISOFA Social Adult Day Standards and local building, fire, safety, and health codes. Local Law 9 of 2015 required DIFTA to register SADCs and created the SADC Ombuds Office at DIFTA. In this capacity, DIFTA accepts and responds to SADC-related inquiries and complaints and has developed an online registration data base for all social adult day programs operating within New York City. DIFTA has recently updated this system to allow SADC providers to create a unique account for their program with direct access to their registration information for real-time program information updates. Local Law 9 of 2018 requires that DIFTA create and maintain an online public searchable database of social adult daycare programs registered with the agency. While DIFTA works with New York City Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications to build an enhanced database with additional functionality for the public, there are currently two interim ways for the public to obtain information on SADCs. One option utilizes the New York City Open Data Portal, which provides access to a complete list of registered sites that is available for download. The second option is through DIFTA's website. On the agency website, individuals can search by borough, zip code, program name, and service type. Once a specific program is selected, complete program information will be available, including name, address, phone number, days and hours of operation, service provided, and whether the program is DIFTA funded. Through concrete practice and day-to-day -day application of the law since the SAD Ombuds Office was launched, DIFTA has tested and developed a working protocol to establish a system to receive comments and complaints about SADCs, investigate such complaints, and inform relevant agencies of the results of such investigations. Through this pro though this process has taken longer than initially anticipated, we are currently working closely with the law department to develop rules to formalize this protocol and implement the corresponding penalty structure. Since DIFTA was designated as the SADC Ombuds Office, important interagency relationships have been forged and new partners have emerged, each integral to DIFTA's implementation of the law. On the city level, these active partners include the Fire Department, the Department of Buildings, and DOHMH. Key partners on the state level include the New York State Office of Health Division of Long-Term Care, NYSOFA, and OMIG, the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General. DOHMH, who will testify later about food safety inspections in SADCs and senior centers, will send letters to all registered SADCs this month. The letters will inform SADCs about requirements for food service establishment permits and food safety inspections. DIFTA provided DOHMH with the most recent list of registered SADCs to facilitate their site visits to ensure that food service establishment permits will be obtained if necessary. Ongoing collaborative activities proceed along two tracks, addressing complaints and education. The discussion of complaints and education are combined during DIFTA's participation in bi-monthly meetings with the MLTCs convened by OMIG and public education forums on social adult daycare services. The public education team includes DIFTA, OMIG, and the New York State Attorney General's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. In addition, on March 23rd of this year, DIFTA hosted the first Social Adult Day Regulations Training for the 20 MLTCs with contracted Social Adult Day programs in New York City. Additional invitees included DOHMH, NYSOFA, OMIG, and the New York State Adult Day Services Association, which is a statewide membership organization for operators of Social Adult Day programs. 
as many complaints received by the SADC Ombuds Office include nutrition or food quality concerns, the focus of this initial training was on the NISOFA nutrition standards. NISADSA led the training and DOHMH discussed the health code requirements for licensing of food handlers and certification of food service establishments. Intro, ninth, intro number 399A, a report on senior centers. As I mentioned, our testimony will also discuss intro number 399A. I'd like to preface this discussion with a brief update on the senior center model budget. Last month during DIFTA's testimony before this committee on the FY19 preliminary budget, Commissioner Corrado announced that the administration allocated $10 million in baseline funding for senior centers beginning in FY18, which will increase to 20 million by FY21. These funds, as you know, were de designated to help create parity in our senior center budgets and provide adequate funding to achieve an expanded array of programming across the senior center system. We'd like to take this opportunity to briefly go over the process by which DIFTA arrived at a fair and equitable model budget, as well as the process by which the 10 million will be distributed to providers in FY 18 and 19. DIFTA and the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget with input from our network of providers and other stakeholders, conducted a thorough analysis of the existing line item budgets and spending patterns across our portfolio of 249 senior centers. As a result, we identified several characteristics that exemplify high quality programs, highlighting strong leadership and a rich array of health and education programming. We then compared existing budgets to the funding patterns that support the key attributes of high quality programs and calculated the need for each senior center based on where their current budgets compare to the model. The network of 249 senior centers was divided into five groups based on average daily participants. In recognition of the fact that there are certain costs that vary based on the size of a center, such as the need for modestly more staff to run a very large center compared to a very small one. At the same time, the model recognizes that there are certain fixed costs for running a center, irrespective of average daily participants. The resulting amounts given to each center were divided between an amount for program staff and another for programming, based on each center's areas of need. However, funding remained flexible across line items with certain, within certain parameters, thus allowing centers to identify their most critical needs and submit proposals accordingly. In March, senior centers, all but 26, were notified of the amounts they will receive for both FY18 and FY19. They have since submitted their proposals for use of the funds. Depending on individual urgent needs, a number of centers have proposed that some of the funds allocated to them be used for purposes other than those dictated by the model, such as one-time needs. This was a thoroughgoing, year-long process in which many of our external partners played an important role. Ultimately, we believe our mutual goal of equity was met. We are confident in the soundness of our formula and processes and intend to implement a similar methodology for future right-sizing efforts. For instance, as you know, the model does not address food costs. We're currently in the process of working on an evaluation of food services across programs. This work is being done with the help of a consultant and we anticipate the analysis will be completed later this year. Our goal for the second phase of the model is to evaluate how to achieve efficiencies in food procurement, preparation and delivery, while increasing quality and choice. The senior center model budget is in line with the spirit of the legislation. While DIFTA collects a number of the data elements in the proposed legislation, other data elements are not readily available and may also pose data gathering issues for our senior center provider network. We'd be happy to discuss further as the administration supports efforts to share pertin pertinent information with the council and the general public. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony on social adult daycare and intro number 399A. Following testimony from DOHMH on intro 411, my colleagues and I are pleased to answer any questions you may have. Turning it over to you, Otis. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Chin and members of the Committee on Aging. 
I am Otis Pitts, Assistant Commissioner in the Division of Environmental Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, thank you for the opportunity to testify on Introduction 411. The Department permits and inspects food service establishments under Article 81 of the New York City Health Code, which defines food service establishment as a place where food is provided to the consumer, whether it is provided free of charge or sold, and whether consumption occurs on or off premises. Our regulated establishments range from restaurants and mobile food units to cafeterias, caterers, and food operations and charitable organizations. Social adult daycares that serve food to clients may be included in this category as well and are required to be permitted and inspected by the department if they meet the health code's definition of a food service establishment. The department is working with the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, to identify social adult daycares and then will determine which ones are covered under the health code. We've begun the process of inspecting and permitting these facilities and will soon send letters to all social adult daycares registered with DIFTA. This letter will notify them of the process for applying for a food service establishment permit. The department supports the intent of introduction 411, which would require the department to annually inspect social adult daycares classified as food service establishments and report on these activities. We are committed to working with DIFTA and the city's social adult daycare facilities to regulate the proper entities as food service establishments. And we look forward to working with council on this piece of legislation. Thank you, and we're happy to, to take any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I am gonna start with a couple of questions um, for DIFTA first. Um, in terms of local law nine, it was passed in 2015. Why is it taking so long to promulgate rules? I mean, you're still working on it. What's the problem? Well, we did initially draft rules, and the law department did not approve our initial proposed rules pursuant to section 1043C and D of the charter. And so now, based on conversations about the additional proposed rules with the law department, we're developing processes based on the day-to-day -day experience and expertise of our staff that comports with the law department's feedback and that works in practice rather than continuing to try to amend the initially proposed rules. And the current protocol, which Robin is happy to walk you through, um, is really a result of the work over the last uh, two years, two plus years, and is currently being drafted into legislative language that would be appropriate with rulemaking. So in essence, um, from the time of the original draft of the rules, we have really through hard work and rolling out of this program, now really developed a protocol that we think is working very well. Um, and maybe Robin could kind of work you th walk you through the process. So once we get a, uh, a referral, we will first check to see if it's in our database, if it's registered or not, and proceed. If it's not registered, then we contact them and say you have to register. Uh, we acknowledge the complaint um, has been received um, to the complainant. We let them know that. And uh, so what we would do then, once we get the complaint, we would look against the state standards to see if any of those standards are implicated in the particular complaint. And what we have found is that it has, and this has been, we've talked about this at each of our hearings, um, about the importance of the various uh, relationships that have developed over time with the city agencies who have um, the expertise in a lot of the areas that, uh, where we have received complaints. So certainly our partners at city DOHMH uh, have been critical to our response to health uh, complaints around the food safety, et cetera. And um, we would do, we would forward the complaints to the respective uh, city agency. Um, if it does not involve those agencies, uh, we would then conduct an investigation if it means uh, a site visit or we sometimes need to contact the complainant for further information. Um, as an aside, I would just like to say that many times when we get um, these complaints, it's, we cannot respond to the complainant because it's either anonymous or the information that's been provided to us goes nowhere, whether it's the phone or email address. 
Um, but at any rate, uh, what we would expect is that we would, if there was a violation of the uh, state standards, that we would then make a finding and request a corrective action plan from the contracted MLTC. If the MLTC agrees with the finding, they would request a corrective action plan from the Social Adult Day. If Social Adult Day and MLTC and uh, ombuds agree that the corrective action plan is adequate and it meets uh, the complaint, then um, the case is closed, essentially. Um, however, if the MLTC and or social adult um, reject that, they have the right to appeal to the commissioner. Um, and then uh, with that, it would be up to the commissioner to uphold the complaint or um, what's the opposite of upholding? Um, say it isn't actually a complaint, um, or if it's insufficient, if the cap is insufficient. And then the MLTC would have the opportunity to appeal um, the penalty that would be issued at that point, and they could appeal to oath. We, we're gonna go over um, your, the report that you just submitted um, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, but I, I wanna start with, there are, from your testimony, that there are 10 social adult daycare that receive state and city funding uh, that differ overseas. So with those uh, social adult daycare, you conduct annual visits and evaluation. Are there any complaints that, that you have received about the nine that you have oversight over? No, no. That's good. Notice, note the also, good you know, when you were mentioning the ten, uh, seven, or sorry, the nine are city funded, but there are also some that receive uh, nice sofa funding. Uh, there's three that receive funding from them. Uh, two, I believe, are also in our portfolio. But you said um, in your testimony, you said there was nine total. That's the one that get the city uh, funded. There was ten. Yeah. Um, and now there's nine. One, one of our 10 uh, stopped uh, operating, they closed. Okay, um, we have also been joined by Council Member Drum. Um, so in the, the local law of 2015, uh, that require all the social adult daycare to register with DIPTA and to post a sign on site with information about how to con uh, contact the ombudsperson if an individual has a a comment or a complaint uh, regarding the social adult daycare. So what has DIFTA done to ensure that these social adult daycares are in compliance with this requirement? I mean, right now there are 350 of them. Do you know if all 350 are, I assume they're registered, you got the number, mm -hmm. but if they are following the rules, they post signs up with the information? While we have not gone into all 350 sites, when we have done site visits, um, we check to see that the signs are posted and they are posted. Um, further, we've had um, social adult days who have registered with us who have asked for translations of the signs uh, that we responded and made the translations and sent to them. Well, the number is growing. I mean, uh, from your testimony, in the last couple of years, just now there are more social adult daycare program than senior centers. Right. And they're really competing. I mean, we've heard testimony from our senior center providers that these social adult daycare are actually competing with our senior center because they offer everything for free and including transportation. So, um, and in your testimony, you also talk about um, MLTC self-certify. So who is really checking on whether they are complying with the rules? And that's one of the reasons why we are proposing legislation, uh, Intro 411, to get the Department of Health involved. Because in the past two years, we haven't been able to get Department of Health involved. And we've heard back from our senior center providers, they tell us, hey, Department of Health, come to inspect our kitchen, how come Nobody is checking on these social adult daycare. They also serve food. And you know, I am glad to hear that you're starting that process, but it's sort of like it took us to introduce the legislation to sort of like push you in that direction because somebody has to be providing the oversight. 
self-certification, it's not working. I mean, it's like nobody is really checking. The amount of social adult daycare that's popping up all over the city, especially in immigrant neighborhood in Queens and Brooklyn, how do you, I mean, have the Department of Aging, have you sort of compared the data in terms of how many senior centers uh, that you have in those boroughs and neighborhood versus social adult daycare? Have you done some kind of comparative analysis to see like where these social adult daycares are popping up? Are they really providing a need that the senior centers are not able to do in certain areas? In but fact, are they just popping up in similar areas? In fact, we have just begun doing exactly that through our planning um, division, looking to see on maps where are the social adult days located vis-a-vis -vis the senior centers. Um, I, I will say, though, at the beginning of um, the Ombuds history, we did get several, quite a few uh, complaints from senior centers about you know their uh, participants being stolen, but that has um, appreciably dropped off, basically has not happened of late. So I'm not sure what really to glean from that. Um, but, and I would also like to say with um, Department of, City Department of uh, Mental Health, um, Health and Mental Hygiene, I was actually gl delighted to see this uh, law, the legislation come out because we had actually been doing that with um, some of our initial uh, referrals before the law came out to have health go out. And you're right, they are very comprehensive in their assessments when they do those site visits. So they have been a really, really great partner for us. That's great, but we want them to do it every year, like do the annual mandated visit so that we can ensure that our senior, the most vulnerable seniors are being protected. I mean, that's why we try to get it just the city agency to do that. But of course, the, the problem is the, the state um, agency is not really taking an active role in sort of providing oversight uh, to these uh, social adult daycare. Um, I'm gonna ask if uh, some of my colleagues might have a question. Okay, Council Member Vallone, and I'll come back. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So following on that, questioning before we talk about some of the other 399, the concern we've always had is the amount of layers of responsibility that DIFTA has. And we've always fought as a council to try to get you the extra resources and the budget to address because every year it gets more. And, if, and if the, as the years I'm sitting here, they keep shifting more responsibilities onto DIFTA's shoulders. But I would like to see DIFTA take the step of saying, with regard to these extra responsibilities and statutory guidelines, that on an annual basis, we need extra budget to deal with that. Because otherwise, it's just going to completely grow to the point where we're going to keep asking for recording bills on information and layering additional statutes on top, where it's it's just going to get to a point of an overwhelming. I see it on all three sides, from your side, from our side, from the seniors telling us where it's going. But for example, Councilmember Chin was just asking about the site. Who performs the site visits? Do you have actual inspectors now? For the social adult day programs, it's myself and um, depending on the language of the site, it we're able to pull from other staff within DIFTA who are uh, language proficient or from within our own ombud staff. Um, at this point, we prefer to go out in pairs um, because we just don't know what we're seeing. Um, and, and that's basically it. So you, currently we have a staff of three. We have three. Um, we have uh, one staff member who is um, very knowledgeable um, about the communities, particularly the Asian communities. Another staff member, uh, and, and this staff member is also very um, technologically uh, astute. We have another staff member who provides all sorts of administrative support for us. And then the director that we have uh, taken great pains to find a director who has just the skills that we feel is necessary to provide this sort of 
Ombuds Oversight, who has an extensive history in corporate compliance. And so um, she's not here a year yet, so we'll see where we go as, as she becomes more knowledgeable and familiar with um, the landscape. Um, we'll see how, so far so good. Well, I, I know it's not your primary job, mm -hmm. and I know it's not the other two individuals, so we have three people who are now being pulled to do site selections and surveys and visitations. It's, it's not an answer, it's not, and it's not fair to you to do that. I mean, you've got enough to do, as does everyone else in DIFTA. We, we should be fighting for the creation especially for the state's lack of involvement in these issues. And that's been something that the Assistant Commissioner and we have been talking about, that the state was mandated to do these things. And the fact that they haven't forced us as a city to say, hey, they, within our city borough, we need to do something. Uh, three is not an answer. So I, 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 we have to fight for a creation of a division of a unit that can report to you and you tell them exactly what they need to do, and then you can give us that data based on the new inspectors that were hired simply for this purpose, and what the state of those social adult daycares are, and what the violations that are in existence. Is there any coordination now between what you've personally seen since you've gone, and what existing state visitations have resulted, in, whether in any inspections or conditions to the social adult daycare is is the next step should be or if it's going is the coordination between state and city so that you're not reduplicating the wheel and if they've been cited for a b and c and then you've gone out there and say hey no a b and c is still a problem mm -hmm. does that data get back and is it handled in any way so just to go back to the law for a moment um as the law is written, it is complaint driven. So we do not go out and inspect on a regular basis the 300 plus social day care. We go in and perform a site visit or review based on investigating a complaint. And as we have reviewed, and you know, the State Department of Health and the managed long-term care entity actually has both the contractual relationship with the SADC and is responsible for oversight. So they do an initial assessment and then they are required to make sure that they are following the guidelines. Are you aware of those assessments and what the violations they may have? Yes, I can take that. Yes. And one of the approaches we've taken, um, which I think is going to be extremely effective, is beginning to train or inviting the, they're not, they're not mandated to come to our training, but inviting the MLTCs to join us in trainings, um, and they seem to be mm -hmm. participating, um, and so in, constantly reminding them of their oversight responsibility and giving them all of the tools to do that is is one of the approaches that we're taking. But that's where we were years ago. I mean, we, we, we acknowledged that they've dropped the ball. We all agree with that. And I, you're saying that it's obviously not an annual, but it's complaint driven. I don't think Council Member Chin or any of the council members have not received at least one question, query, or complaint at one of the social adult daycares. So it's going to re require an yes. annual visit to every one of them anyway, because at some point somebody's complained about something. So there's, there's always going to be a track record there based on that and the growing size and, and the complaints of the parity of what a senior center has to provide versus a social adult daycare. There has to be a complete dedication to restaffing and budgetary purposes to, to give you the tools, and we want to do that. We've, Council Member Chen and I, especially in under her purview as chair, have been fighting to give DIFTA those resources, and that's why we're always screaming at budget time, it's not enough, it's just clearly not enough. Um, I, there's, there's so many, there's pages and pages <laughs> on all the good stuff of what we're talking about today, but um, since I am proud of 399, I, I, I see that you had testimony specific as to basically starting that process, and I'm happy we're doing that. And clearly, I mean, you even stated that we're not there yet, and whether foods costs or meal evaluation and getting the, the, the partners in to give the information, again, it's an overwhelming task and what we're asking to do, but and again, for us to fight for those things on all the list of costs and reimbursements to senior centers, 
having that data is so important pre-budget so that we can, again, work with and fight with whoever's at the administration at that point to say we need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the steps that were taken, I thank you for that, um, but I think it also clearly shows why we need a type of a bill like this so that it becomes part of the annual information that's there and so that we don't have to wait for uh, a consultant or someone to give us back information. It is, you said they separated it into five groups, the different senior centers. Was it just based on size or were there other parameters that were used? The, the main um, characteristic was average daily participation which by that we mean, um, and I'm sure you've heard over the years and we heard very loudly that you know meal utilization is not the best way to really measure um, who's coming to a senior center. So by average daily participation, that means every center, every senior that actually crosses the threshold. So they may not be coming for lunch, but they're coming for an art class or for Tai Chi. Um, so we've been capturing that data and those are what the five buckets were based on. Do we have that data? I, I, I haven't seen it. So have we exchanged that information onto how the senior centers are broken down? May I, um, I, I don't need to know see. that we have, but we can, yeah, yes. I, that's part of why we need to do these things, so I can look at how you're doing that and how we can help and how we can address the differences in senior centers and what the needs are, clearly why uh, the purpose of this. So, you know, clearly DIFTA believes in, in complete transparency and we do have you know endless amounts of data and are happy to sit with any of you and walk through that um, you know how you slice and dice it and all of the different ways in which you can analyze the data you know could go on sort of forever so certainly as you have questions or issues we're always happy to sit down and provide the data or you know walk you through it and the last thing, and I'll, I'll turn it back to our chair, and then we'll come back. Um, you gave the senior centers some leeway, it looks like. You put in March, senior centers all but 26 were notified of the amounts they will receive. They have submitted their proposals for use of the funds, and then depending on individual urgent needs, a number of centers have proposed that some of the funds be allocated to different purposes. What, what are some of those individual urgent needs? So we allowed for this year, because of how late we are in, in the fiscal year, to um, except basically one-time needs, and that could be, Karen, I don't know if you want to chime in here, but, you know, specific sure. Thanks, Karen. individual needs of the center. Right. The, um, the funding allocations, uh, of course, started in FY18 this year, and it's the same allocation for FY19, say they got the same amount of funding, but as Karen said, because it's so late in the year to hire a staff person, a new staff person that's needed that they can in, bring somebody on in July or, uh, you know, for the following year, what are they going to do with the funds that they're getting this year? And so since many of our centers do have immediate needs, such as equipment, kitchen equipment purchases or some small renovations or uh, special, special costs that they can accomplish by the end of the fiscal year, some of those funds that they couldn't put towards staff costs this year, they were um, allowed to use uh, for the FY18 budget. And then in FY19, they allocated for, usually for staff and some consultant lines. Is there a consistency there as to certain needs that seem to rise to the top across the board, or is it just truly just individual? Well, the, the, the funding is sort of d uh, split between direct personnel needs and uh, program needs, which really translates to consultants or staff persons that are hired specifically to conduct programming, such an as an instructor, whatever. So yes, most of, the, um, most of what we've been seeing in the budgets are increases for staff lines that were underpaid, basically, um, and a number of new staff lines. Uh, be it assistant directors, program coordinators, sometimes a data person to come in, whatever the, pro the individual program determined as its needs at this point. 
See, and I'll end it on that. I think those are the perfect examples. When you're getting urgent needs that we as a council can then address, especially on a yearly basis for budget, you telling us, listen, the top 10 urgent needs that we're being faced on 18 and 19 and 20 are these, so we need to address them now while we talk about the rest of the budget. I think that's an opportunity missed for us to look at that data and see the, the, the heartbeat of what's happening so that we can get the funding directly for it. If there is a certain position that across the board seems to be missing at a senior center, then we gotta fund that position. If we're losing because of salary disparity mm -hmm. between certain staff, then we have to talk about salary disparity. Mm -hmm. so th thank you, Madam Chair, as always. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna have another hearing on the model budget. Unfortunately, I'm getting uh, comments back. So the formulas and there's got to be some flexibility and also um, depending on the, the centers and their uniqueness or whatever. So it just can't be just um, not flexible. So we really have to, okay. to look we at that. Really, we're um, striving for flexibility, so we're mm -hmm. happy to sit down and talk about that and we're also pushing for the money um, to be in the budget sooner so even though in your testimony you said FY 21 we're at pushing for much earlier FY 20 to get the full 20 million we might have to get more but we're gonna work on that um, council member Ayala followed by council member Rose question good morning thank you madam chair my question is really around the uh, social adult daycare uh, program model because my understanding, and I did s senior services for quite uh, some time, is that in order for you to be eligible for the social adult daycare model, you have to be, you're, usually clients are a little bit more frail um, and require a more intimate type of attention. But they have to also be Medicaid eligible. So I wonder, is there any oversight that looks into the possibility of Medicaid fraud? Because my understanding is that a lot of these uh, participants are not even eligible, and they are essentially being stolen from the senior centers, right, and, um, and brought in with all of these promises of free transportation and free foods and free activities, but they're not necessarily eligible, and I wonder what the oversight for that is. Right, there absolutely is oversight that um, is sometimes a little confusing to us as well, but as you say, um, the observation is correct. Um, Although, um, so at the, at the state level, Maximus is the Medica where Medicaid resides, and uh, when the MLTC wants to refer their consumer to a social adult day, it is Maximus that gives that approval. And in addition, the MLTC certainly has um, medical staff who do the assessment that's required for social adult day. Um, but I think probably what's uh, sort of confusing for us is when we think of the historic social adult day, these are people who are clearly impaired physically and or cognitively. Um, and, you know, we just have to bear in mind that there are impairments that are not so obvious. And so that if Maximus is approving it, there has to be something going on with that individual. So as an example, somebody that has some kind of dementia, Alzheimer's, or other cognitive impairment may not look physically impaired, and you might not notice, you know, just on a visual inspection that actually this person indeed is impaired and needs help with activities of daily living. And, and the um, having Maximus in as that oversight entity is something that has developed since the time of the implementation of that law. So it is an actual third party that was put in there in order to have that kind of oversight role. So that's not just a self-certification. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, due to the collaboration with DIFTA and the New York State Department of Health um, and some managed long-term care um, centers, um, some programs have uh, experienced um, withheld payments or declined payments or even termination of contracts um, because of investigations of some of these SADCs. Um, and the report indicated that there were 44 SADC sites that have closed. 
So could you tell me how many of these sites were closed due to M MLTC um, investigations and um, how many sites have had their um, have MLTC programs withheld or declined payments? So or of, because? Sure, sure. Um, of those 44 sites, many, many of these programs open. They think they're going to do business, but they don't have the contracts and they close before they even anybody walks in the door. So of these 44, we would have to actually go through and, and look at each one, but I dare say that most, if not all, were um, the social adult day program itself closing on its own. Um, what we have seen, though, um, is when we have sent referrals to the State Department of Health, they have the oversight of the MLTCs who contract with the social adult days. When the, and so the state uh, DOH uh, tells the MLTCs, here's the complaint that we've received, go investigate. The MLTCs do their investigation, and there have been a couple of instances where MLTCs, based on their investigation, have decided that, in fact, the complaint is substantiated, and, and it was of a degree such that they wanted to uh, cancel their contract with that social adult day. But that's really been the extent of it. Uh, there has not been, to my knowledge, any social adult day that has been closed as a result of the MLTCs pulling out. None. To and my the, knowledge. And the, and the 44 cases then were? I decided I was going to open the business, but you know what? When I decide, when I see what I had to do, it was really not what I wanted. But not because of any violations. Correct, to my knowledge. We'll we'll go back and double check, but um, it's my understanding that these 44 are just um, self closures. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it? All right, thank you, uh, Council Member Diaz. You have questions? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner and company. <clears throat> Commissioner, I am reading your report, page one, paragraph three of your report. Uh, this one? It reads, the availability of Medicaid financing through the managed long-term care has fostered the continual growth of new social adult day sites throughout the five boroughs, most notably in Brooklyn and Queens. As of today, 350 sites have registered, 142 in Brooklyn, 134 in Queens, 33 in Manhattan, 26 in the Bronx, and 15 in Staten Island. My question, Commissioner, why the discrepancy between Brooklyn, Queens, and the rest of the borough? Is it that you are neglecting the senior citizen population in other boroughs, are you concentrating only to service Brooklyn and Queens? But what happened with Manhattan, Bronx, and Staten Island? Because you have 142 and 134 new programs in, 142 in, Queen, in Brooklyn and 134 in Queens, and only 26 in the Bronx. Somebody's getting the end of the shaft here. Somebody's getting neglected. Why? So, again, DIFTA does not fund or have any kind of contractual relationship. There's no... It is here. <laughs> you can see. No, wow, they, are, you... they open and are run by managed long-term care through and get Medicaid funding. And so we don't have a direct relationship. The law asked us to come in and provide oversight because they for were- se For senior citizens. For senior oh, citizens- everywhere. That have impairments and who are so on there, Medicaid. So there are no such 
a person in the Bronx, in, like you so have in Brooklyn? So how and Queen? where they open, we are not really privy to, and are not sure that whether it's based on where they actually find commercial space, or where the demographic population is, or where there's high density of Medicaid. We're not really certain. Um, we do know that they seem to open in, in immigrant communities. Um, it, it, but this, this report, written by yourself and presented by yourself, made you look, made you look so bad. Uh, okay, again, no this is not us. The Department for the Aging does not open or close or determine where these are located. They are completely funded through Medicaid and not through city tax levy dollars. So we really have now just a legislative, city legislated well, role, arm's length well, in well, providing some oversight. Ain't your department in charge or supposed yeah. to be advocating for senior citizens in ev everywhere in the five bottles? And would you see this kind of? Uh, yeah, so we can, happy to share with you the distribution of our 249 senior centers, which are much more equitably distributed according to um, by borough. And, and I think that would make more sense to focus on. And we can share that data with you. It's very different looking than this data. Just, just defending senior citizens in other boroughs, just trying to be sure that if the department fight for them and advocate for them, and whoever is doing these kind of things doesn't doesn't help. I mean, it looks it, look, it looks good for the senior citizen in, in Brooklyn and and Queen, but doesn't look good for the senior citizen in, in Manhattan and Queens. I mean, in Staten Island and the Bronx, my county. So, so just just venting. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, unfortunately, these are privately run. Right? People open up businesses and uh, decide to run social little daycare. Um, according to the, the report that you submitted, the, uh, the Ombudsperson report for 2018, 49 out of the 126 allegations were possible Medicaid, Medicaid fraud allocations, mm -hmm. allegation. So can you, Drill down a little bit more on that, like how many different social adult daycares were represented in those 49 complaints? I would have to get you um, the details on that, um, but you can see that um, on the first page it's talking about uh, 45 sites altogether received complaints. So within that 45 um, are contained the Medicaid fraud, so we would um, have to get the specifics on that for you. Okay. Um. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I yeah. just wanted to remind you that Otis Pitts is still prepared to testify on the intro regarding health and safety inspection, food inspection. Thank you for that. Oh, I thought he did read his testimony. Okay. Oh, about the bill? I'm happy to take any questions as they relate to introduction 411. Oh, okay, because I know that you testify, I mean. Sorry, I had amnesia for a moment. <laughs> you just want to take the heat off yourself. <laughs> but I do I have lie. questions about. <laughs> Don't worry, you're not, you're not, I still got a whole bunch of questions about the social adult daycare. Um, but with uh, intro 411, let, let's give Otis a little opportunity to, to get in here. So does the, uh, Agency, or the administration support this uh, introduction, 411? Yes, we do support the intent of the bill. Uh, so you're ready to implement? Yes, we've actually already started doing inspections of social adult daycares. Uh, we depend very heavily on our partnership with DIFTA, and as we learn of, of where these folks are operating, we're conducting evaluations site by site to determine whether or not they meet the health code's definition of a food service establishment. So like, right now, like, um, do you also, I mean, I assume you also go out and inspect the senior centers because they do serve food. So out of the 200, 
and 49 senior centers that we have right now in the city. Mm -hmm. This your agency goes out there and do an annual inspection of every single one of them? We do. Uh, they receive one routine inspection per year. However, we have the ability and the authority to return for complaint-based inspections and other follow-up inspections as necessary. So based on that, right, so these social adult daycare should at least get one inspection a year because they do handle, they do serve food. Even we, though they might not cook the food on site, they cater from an outside restaurant, um, but they give out the food and they handle the food. We agree, to the extent they meet the health code's definition of a food service establishment, they'll be subject to that routine inspection and, and other follow-up inspections as necessary. What we've learned in our, our early review of these establishments is that many are using outside vendors, as you mentioned, uh, that happen to prepare food off-site and serve the food on site. And in that case, we would not need to duplicate a permit. So the social adult daycare would not need to secure their own permit as the ha they have a third party coming in that's already permitted by our department. But they still would have to serve the food. They have to... Certainly, to the extent that uh, a social adult daycare is actually involved in any level of, of food handling or food preparation, they'll be subject to a, a permit and an annual inspection. So it's either one, right? I mean, it could be both, but at least minimum that it has to be a food handling uh, permit. Exactly. Okay. It would be our standard food service establishment permit, and they would be treated like any other vendor with that level of, of food preparation ability. In what situation would they not qualify for any of that? Uh, again, we're making this evaluation case by case. Uh, we've seen a number of, of hybrid uh, approaches to, to doing food operations in these settings. Uh, folks that are not involved in any level of food handling or food pr preparation would not need that permit. However, we are seeing a number of establishments that are involved uh, in food handling and the food preparation, and they'll be subject uh, to the, the FSC permit. So you're basing on whether they answer your questionnaire back, whether they uh, serve food or not? No, we're if doing- If they tell you that, oh, we don't serve food, we just have social activity, then you're not gonna inspect them? Again, we're doing a case-by-case -case evaluation uh, that includes uh, site visits to determine whether or not they need a permit. That would be good, because I think every social adult daycare needs to have a site visit from the Department of Health. That's minimal. Um, and then we'll work towards getting a site visit from the Department for the Aging. Because somebody has to be providing this oversight. I mean, isn't there inherent conflict of interest for the MLTC to solely be the one to self-certify and provide the oversight? Because they're signing up members. I mean, this is what we're hearing back from constituents. I mean, they want membership. They want uh, the, the patient to enroll in their MLTC. So there's some inherent conflict right there, and the state is not doing their job to really provide the oversight. But these are vulnerable seniors, seniors who have, you know, extra need. I mean, they, they need extra care, and we're, not, and we're not doing enough to take care of that. I mean, Compared to our daycare center, there's so much regulation on daycare center. And this is daycare for our seniors. And we're not doing the same thing. And that's what we're trying to get at, you know, that we need to have more oversight. And when uh, Councilmember uh, Diaz was raising about the inequity, I mean, like, why are all of them popping up in Brooklyn, Queens? Uh, because large immigrant population that are susceptible to, you know, attraction, oh, free this, free that, and especially free transportation. They pick you up from your home and they bring you to the center. And probably real estate is cheaper uh, in some of the, that part of the, the borough that they could afford to have big, beautiful site. But one of the questions that I, I wanted to also get at is that there are right now only nine social adult daycare um, that the council support, right? And the uh, DIFTA has oversight. And I guess maybe there's a couple more funded by the state mm -hmm. that you also have oversight. Why 
are it's different really it's different looking at helping some of the senior center to be able to start social adult daycare program at their centers or affiliated with the center uh, to serve this population that needs some extra care because right now from my visit to some of the centers, they are already providing care to these populations. Because a lot of them, they come to the center for activity, they come with a home care attendant. So that already meets one of the requirements. But they're not, they're not going to the social adult daycare because they love their senior center. But this could be a source of funding for the senior center. Why hasn't all these years that you have to really look at this resource. Because then you can have direct oversight and then we can have some assurance that these programs you know, will be much better, just like our senior centers. All of a sudden, this last couple of years, for the social adult daycare to like increase in such huge number, right now, more than senior center. I mean, that's, that's, that's not right. So it's DIFTA, I mean, I really urge DIFTA to really look at, and I've spoken also um, to the deputy mayors and, and the OMB. This is a resource. Why aren't we looking at this? And meanwhile, you have all these private entrepreneurs. They're setting up these programs all over the city, and they're calling DIFTA for advice, calling DIFTA for guidance how to set one up. And the newer one that's starting, they're competing against each other. And we're hearing back from constituents, they're paying people, they're providing incentive to attract customers to sign up with them. There's all kinds of hanky-panky going on and wasting Medicaid dollars. And meanwhile, we can do something, DIFTA can do something to really help create some real good social adult daycare. We only got nine out of two. 350? Come on. So is DIFTA going to really take a look at this and see how we can utilize that resource? So, of course, the biggest issue is that we don't have the funding to help provide the startup or, or and funding above and beyond the nine that you're now funding with the city council discretionary dollars. And there are several. Um, within our network that do run Social Adult Day, yeah. either attached to uh, senior centers or freestanding. And they have, the few have been successful, but others that have attempted to open were not able to get sign you know, significant referrals from the MLTCs. That's they were another problem. To, These MLTCs un unable are... Unable to sustain They're referring the to Social Adult Day Care that they are connected with. We all see that there's some conflict, inherent, you know, conflict of interest going on here. And that's why we're trying to figure a way to put in more oversight, more enforcement. But meanwhile, like if, if you have to say we need a certain amount of funding to help start up, let's have a discussion about that. Maybe we could put some funding together to really help senior center develop their own social adult daycare program. We gotta start somewhere. Meanwhile, the private sector is like having a field day starting their social adult daycare. I mean, the good thing is that now because of all the competition, some of the better ones are trying to organize Then maybe we could work with them. Uh, but meanwhile, we have so many good senior centers that can really do this because they're already serving those seniors already, but they're not getting the resources. So can we work together? Can you work with us and see how we can help some of these senior centers develop good models, social adult daycare? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, we should have more discussion in terms of funding sources and how we can really take control over this thing. Okay, what else? Is there no other question?
On the, also on the um, ombudsperson report, were there any uh, resolution to some of the complaints? Like how many centers were fine and um, were there corrective actions? Um, there were through the MLTCs where um, they had issued corrective actions um, to their contracted social adult day um, and ultimately that was um, resolved. Were there, are there any, I mean, are any of these information public? Hmm, I don't know that. Um, I would have to find that out. Uh, at this point, it's just been, um, you know, professional relationship between DIFTA, Ombuds, and State Department of Health. I don't know if they are inclined to have those reports made public, but we could inquire. Is this our, is this the new legislation that we have that we talked about? <laughs> well, can we get DIFTA to commit to posting these on your website, on the information of these MLTC? Because I know that part of the, the law that we pass was we're supposed to have those information posted or the, the violation issue, yeah. but since you didn't have the rules yet, so there's no violation that's been issued. Right. Right, so, um, it's uh, State Department of Health information, and again, that kind of follows with us having to follow up with them to see if they would be okay with us posting that on our website. Okay, but, but when there's a complaint lodged against one of the social adult daycare, mm -hmm. the complaint that you receive, that could be posted. Is that like a due process thing? But they're not on our website. We're going to have to so, look into sorry, that yeah, and get sorry, back to you. Yeah. I think it's a deeper conversation. Yeah. Okay. No, get back to us because we want to... Because like, no, I understand. Yeah, because some of these social adult daycare, if they had violation and people posted violation, I mean, that's one of the reasons why people don't want to complain anymore or even our senior center, they've been raising over and over again that they're getting competitions from the social adult daycare, right? The seniors go there for lunch, but they come back to our senior center for social services. But like, if we haven't done anything um, to penalize some of these social adult daycare who have committed violation, it's kind of like they've been complaining and complaining, but nothing has been done. People are going to stop complaining. So that's what we wanted to really get some result to show that, hey, which is a good social adult daycare, which one are not, mm -hmm. so that people have the information when they have to search for these programs. Right. I think also we want to see is like if an MLTC, they're supposed to be doing the oversight, uh, what is the correction action plan, all those information to be posted. Mm -hmm. So we know that there were some corrective action that was taken. And these MLTC have to be accountable. I just think that if they're just doing self-certification, just like you know we've passed laws um, mandating that the Department of Building go out and do audits because you just can't rely on self-certification. So in, in this situation, we might have to figure a way of getting some audit done, some site visit and some periodically surprise check-in because you're just relying on them to do self-certify. Just how do we know we're getting the correct information if we don't spot check on them? So notwithstanding what you're saying, I just want to add that Based off of the training that we just had with the MLTCs, it's evident that there, there are gaps in their knowledge about what Social Adult Day is supposed to be. But they are very eager to learn, and the dialogue has happened. It has begun to happen with us, between us, the MLTCs, including State Office on Aging, as well as the other uh, state entities. So I'm hopeful. 
I'm hopeful, but I mean, you're right. We could be hopeful, I just wanna... but the fact that all these social adult daycare are popping up. Right now it's at 350. I wouldn't be surprised if that number keeps going up. You know, and the thing is that we're hearing a lot of, you know, complaint from the base. Because we have seniors who actually need these services, but they don't have Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So they are getting rejected right at the door. And who do they complain to, right? Because, well, your insurance doesn't cover. And meanwhile, they see this program offering to all these other people in the neighborhood free transportation. That is such an attraction. I mean, we couldn't even get that for our senior who are going to the senior center. Uh, so that's why it's, that's what I, I'm urging you to really look at how do we help uh, our senior center develop these programs to really utilize that resource because they are serving already some of the, the most vulnerable seniors, but they're not getting the resources to help them. I mean, that's my, where my frustration is because I see a new one popping up here and there. I mean, they are renting dance studio. Right now is a social adult daycare. A restaurant catering hall right now right. is a social adult daycare. The rent is so expensive. How can they afford it? But they're recruiting members because everything is free. So we got to really have some oversight. And that's when, when I looked at the, your report about, you know, possibility of Medicare fraud, mm -hmm. Medicaid fraud, we should really drill down on those because that is Medicaid fraud. Well, it's as you had said, you know, who's giving uh, the, the free rides or paying participants to participate. Yes, there's lots of different kinds of Medicaid fraud that we've been, uh, that's been reported to us. Yeah, and that's what we need to really, I mean, the, the public education part, I think we really mm -hmm. need to step up on that. Right. It's not enough to educate the MLTC. Uh, it's, we need to educate the public. But then we have to have alternative. Which are the good ones that they should go to? Mm -hmm. And if our senior center can develop their own social adult daycare, then people know that, oh, I go to a senior center, and if my parent needs some extra care, they can still continue to stay in this center because they have a social adult daycare attached to the center. So that, that is something that we really need to look at growing uh, and supporting our senior centers because they're already taking care of this population. So we've still got a lot of work to do. We do. Any other questions? Oh, okay, just uh, one last question. Um, on, a, on the senior center, according to the, the mayor's uh, management report, seniors have been, senior centers have been experiencing a decline in utilization rate during the past five years. In fact, five years ago in 2012, senior centers had a utilization rate of 93%, and in 2016, the, utilis uh, the utilization rate was 85%, and last year it was down to 81%. Are you looking at that, uh, that drop? Do you want to respond? What I alluded to earlier about um, being able to look at the average daily participation rate is really what we would like to have re to report in the MMR. And when you look at the average daily participation, in fact, our utilization is very high, um, almost at much closer to 100%. So I think some of that was, you know, based on only looking at the meal data. And we now capture that information through our STARS system. So when you do the, the average participation rate, so if you have one senior that comes in for a meal and they come in for the art class and they also go to the exercise class, is that senior counted three times? No, uh, the senior is counted once. Um, the program uh, reports units of service for each of those activities. But uh, when we're looking at average daily attendance, we're looking at any, 
the number of individuals that come into the center and get any kind of service. They could come in once and go to one service or they could stay all day and go to everything the center has to offer and they would be counted once. Units of service is a different statistic. We're talking about the number of people that actually attend the center on a daily basis and that number has risen. Okay, so, but you do count in terms of the number of programs. Oh, absolutely, people... meals and sessions and all of that, yes. Okay. Are there any other questions for my colleague? Council Member Traeger, do you have a question before I let the panel go? Just to commend you, Chair, for being very um, on top of this issue from day one. You have 142 in I, Brooklyn. I am not surprised. We see them popping up everywhere, um, but I just want to say that you have, in the last council and, and continuing in, in this council term, you have, sh you have shown the type of leadership that's necessary to hold folks accountable. And uh, I just, just want to actually, the, my comment is commending you oh, and, thank and your you. staff. Thank but you. But we still got a long way to go. Um, yes. But also looking at these social adult daycare, the reason why they're tracking so many seniors, one of the things is transportation. So that is something that we really need to look at our senior center and see how we can supplement transportation. Because they have, you know, they're frail seniors cannot just walk that five block to the senior center. And if we provide transportation, they might be able to, to come every day instead of one or two days a week. Sure. Uh, you know, we do have transportation services. I think that um, uh, we have a number, of, we have our, what we call our standalone transportation programs, which are contracts that, uh, programs that we contract to do nothing but transportation both group and individual transportation. And then a number of senior centers also have their own transportation services. I think that there are, uh, and I can't hazard a guess, but I'm sure there are thousands of seniors that get to the senior center every day through transportation services that are provided through either through the standalones or through the senior center transportation. Um, and we do have some that also provide for uh, the, the frail and so forth, but I think that that's something that we have been trying to expand and in this last RFP or this last contract for transportation, we've tried to emphasize more opportunity for what we call individual transportation, which would be for mm -hmm. people who need to be picked up at their home and taken to a program at the center. So we're definitely working on that. No, we definitely need to expand that. Yeah. I know uh, Council Member Vallone, um did a pilot project in his district. So I think that's something that we could model after because that is so critical to be able to provide that transportation for a senior, um, to be able to get the socialization, get the nutritious meal. Um, so that's something that we will continue to work on. Um, no more questions? Oh, one more? Just one. Do you think that the utilization rate for uh, the participation rate for members coming in um, for lunch dropped after DIFTA kind of implemented all of these healthy eating models that don't necessarily seem to work? Uh, for the senior population, I get a lot of complaints about um, the meals only because I think that DIFTA missed an opportunity to educate um, their members on eating culturally relevant meals that were prepared in a healthier fashion and instead replace those culturally relevant meals with meals that they cannot recognize and do not oftentimes know how to even pronounce. And so a lot of times I get complaints from seniors in my district that they go to the senior center for services but don't necessarily stay for meals every day because they don't like the food that's being prepared. Um, and they don't recognize it. And so I wonder if when the changes were implemented, because I know when I, when I was working, at, when I, I was directing my senior center, we provided meals that maybe were not the healthiest, um, and it seemed like I was at home most of the time, and we were eating what I was eating at home for dinner, um, but we couldn't keep you know, up with the demand of seniors that were coming in to eat. And since the change 
the changes occurred, right, and I, I understand the need for it, right, we want to make sure that people are eating um, meals that are, are, are good for them, that there was a drop, or it almost it feels that way. So I wonder if that's, if that's the perception that you are receiving, that you have as well. I don't know what the correlation is, actually, between the, um, you know, the uh, implementation of the city food standards. There are definitely, we've had a lot of discussions with senior center uh, directors and food service staff about the sodium and the, you know, uh, carbohydrates and so forth. Um, we do have a team of nutritionists. Every senior center has a nutritionist. Um, that works with that program and it, we have done a lot of work on a one-to-one -one basis going out and helping the program and we, we uh, as well as having an internal database that all of the programs are hooked up to called Simple Servings which can give the program ideas on how to meet both, meet cultural uh, demand as well as uh, the food service requirement, I mean the, um, yeah, the food standard requirements. So it can be challenging but we have, um, We've had some good success, and we'd be happy to, if you want to have your senior centers in your area, contact us. We'd be glad to, to look at it individually. Yeah, I think that will work. I know that uh, Cavallo, for instance, is, is doing oh. really well. Yes. So they have three meal options, right? right. So you, you don't like one, you can pick the other. But most senior centers don't have you know, the, uh, the resources to right. provide options. And so I think that for those senior centers, they struggle. And mm -hmm. so to uh, Council Member Chen's uh, question about the utilization rate, do you, tr do you track that by borough in terms of you know, how, which senior centers have seen a, a significant reduction? We have all the statistics by senior center, Ooh, and then of course the senior center. Would you share borough. that information? I would love to see what that looks like in my district. On the meals? I would love to be helpful. A meal utilization? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. You can do that. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, to the, for testifying, for coming here today, and we look forward to continue to work with you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call up Andrea. Siafani from Live On New York. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's just me? <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Andrea Gianfrani. I'm the Director of Public Policy for Live On New York. Uh, Live On New York represents 100 member agencies that provide services for over uh, 600 programs throughout the city for older adults. Um, I'll be brief today because there's been a lot of great conversation. Uh, my written testimony has more full details about our comments on both pieces of legislation, but I'll just jump right into um, talking about intro um, 399A. Uh, while we don't have a formal position on um, intro 399A at this time, we do thank Council Member Vallone and co-sponsors of this bill for the efforts to better understand the utilization and reimbursement rates of different services at senior centers. We agree that analyzing data and current util utilization will help us better plan for serving today's older adults as well as build a system for the future. Senior centers do collect um, a great amount of data through the STARS database system, which is as time consuming as it is important for an understaffed network. So again, when we look at legislation that, that looks at more data collection, we really look at it through the lens to ensure that the data that's being collected would not um, create new burdensome requirements that would, um, you know, be a, a stress on the system. That being said, we do know that this data collection is very important to building our systems. We also want to make sure that we are being cognizant of, of what new analytics we can look at to ensure that we can understand the system better. Uh, generally speaking, and I think there was a lot covered today um, with the back and forth between DIFTA and Council about some of the data points in, in the bill, but there is some in, um, data points in 399 that are currently collected, and there are some that are not collected, or maybe they're collected in just a different way. So our recommendations for this legislation at this time are to, to kind of look at that, and we're really encouraged to hear that both DIFTA and Council had a really good dialogue to seem to want to move forward to look at some of those um, pieces of data that can help better understand 
plan and help advise in the budget process each year. I'll highlight just a few here as far as what we were looking at with the legislation. Um, first, the term affiliated sites within the legislation was not um, fully dis defined, so we were a little unclear in seeking some clarification as to who this um, legislation would apply to. We do know it did say senior centers and innovative, innovative senior centers, um, but the term affiliated sites was not defined, so that was um, an area we would seek clarification. Um, another key area that DIFT had talked about at length was the issue of what is an attendee, and I think that's a really important issue to highlight because um, seniors do use different services at senior centers, um, and there's um, a lot of different ways things are counted, so I think that that was, um, you know, something important that we wanted to highlight here as well as to um, to really look at how that's being counted and, and what that means in the definition of the legislation. And again, um, senior centers, as we're looking ahead, um, services are changing, and and we and our members really are looking to be innovative and and change with with the needs of seniors who are using their services. So it's really important to look at that data and understand what the needs are of today and in the future. Um, there are a couple other areas um, that we wanted to highlight again that are in our legislation or in our testimony. Um, one minor point is the ratio of case managers to seniors. Um, senior centers typically don't have um, case managers like a case management agency would, so that was just an area we wanted to highlight. Um, overall, we definitely support the idea of using current data to understand the needs um, of, of today's seniors and, and services of the future and to help project these programs as they grow. We really appreciate um, Council's consideration of the above comments that we're, we're submitting, and we're also very encouraged to hear today the dialogue uh, between Council and DIFTA to, look, to work together um, in understanding these needs. Um, on to intro 411, uh, Live on New York supports this legislation. We do believe that it's important for social adult day centers to be safe establishments. It's our understanding that senior centers are already inspected on an annual basis, as was outlined today here, and this bill would not new add any new requirements upon senior centers. Um, senior centers are also subject to other various inspections and audits throughout the year and subject to the DIFTA senior center standards, which include nutrition requirements. We support imposing these same requirements that are placed on senior centers with these inspections on the social adult days and believe that it's important to make sure they're safe places for older, older adults to receive services. So we do support this legislation. And there were just a couple more um, notes I wanted to highlight um, based on the conversation that was um, discussed today. Um, transportation, Councilmember Chin, thank you for bringing that up. It's a really important issue. We do have Live on New York in our annual budget priorities does have a $1 million request for transportation for the exact reasons you highlighted today. Um, it's really important for seniors to be able to access these services, and that's one area that we know um, there are some great programs, and we only hope that we can continue to build upon them so that seniors have more access to these services services. Uh, a second uh, very important note that I would like to make is about um, uh, including additional funds for meals, both congregate and home delivered. We talked a little bit about today the model senior center budget and as Dipton noted um, they are looking ahead at uh, phase two as they said about meals and looking at increasing efficiencies across the board and costs and that's um, something that we're very much looking forward to learning about. Um, in the meantime, senior centers really have needs to um, be able to address senior hunger through both congregate meals and home delivered meals. So while we eagerly await the um, information that comes out of that study, we know that we have immediate needs and we have a request in our budget priorities that the advocates are requesting over $12 million to help um, bolster the the efforts for both congregate meals and home delivered meals to address senior hunger. So we really hope that the city considers that as we work together on that issue. Um, the last point I just want to make is that these services are really important, uh, the DIFTA funded services across the board and um, having awareness and you know, a campaign that really helps seniors know that these services are available. There are a lot of different services for for all different needs that, that people might want to access and to know that these services are available and that are safe and they're accessible to seniors and all of the communities across the city is really important. So we're, we're always looking for ways to work with the city and with the council to increase that awareness among the city. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today on these important issues and for your leadership. Thank you. Andrea, I, I wanted to ask you a question because uh, when we were talking with the um, Department for the Aging, uh, the idea of really helping senior center 
develop good quality social adult daycare program. Um, it doesn't have to be huge, right? It could be that serving a, a certain small group of seniors that have, um, that needs extra care. And I think a lot of the centers already are serving these seniors, but they're not really getting any extra resources. So um, can you also like talk about maybe with the providers? Mm -hmm. Are senior center interested in doing that if there are support in place to help them? Because right now, from the um, presentation, there are only nine social adult daycare um, that they have oversight, which mm -hmm. the council also provides some additional uh, discretionary funding. And these nine sites are also senior centers. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question, and it's a hard question because you, you know the question is if you have the funding, can you do the service? And it's you know you go back and forth with that. And I think um, you know there are some incredible agencies, and the the nine um, discretionary funded um, programs do a really good job of um, connecting services to older adults. They have the expertise in their communities. They are the nonprofits that you would rely on. Um, they, they offer the continuum of services, so whether it be the senior center or, you know, they're, they're connected to the network, so they're, they're doing a really good job of um, those services that they're providing. So I think it's a really great place to start to, to talk with them and, and looking if, if the city is um, invested financially as well as, um, you know, providing the resources to expand that program to really start there and talk with them and, and expand. And, and we'd be happy to work with our membership um, and the council and the city to, to kind of walk through that. But I think you're, you know, you're right. It really comes down to funding and resources. Um, there are things that you'll need, you know, even just issues of space. You know, you need additional space within your programs or connected to your program. So there's a lot that you'd need to work through. And again, with that comes resources. But if there's an investment, um, a concerted investment of those resources, I think it's something that programs would be willing to consider and, and take a look at. Because as you heard today, um, DIFTA testified that the, you know, the um, discretionary funded, I believe they said that there was no complaints about those mm -hmm. through the Ombuds program. And we know, you know, we know our members, we know they're offering quality, safe services in these establishments, but we know that they need resources. So I think um, you have a very good core group that is, that are offering these services to work with to, and, and we'd be happy to talk more about that with our membership as well. Yeah, I would appreciate that because I think it's like on one hand we asked DIFTA to really look at it, but it would be great if it was also coming from the providers who is willing to step up and say, hey, we are interested in, in developing um, a social adult daycare model uh, attached to our senior center, and then we can begin to figure out how much resources we need and how to help um, to support that. Because going forward, we know that we need more of these programs. Mm -hmm. Because um, the aging population is growing and we have more frail elderly, we want to make sure that they are taken care of and they're in good environment. So this is something that we wanted to sort of work towards. Same thing as the, you know, the uh, the NORC model, the natural occurring mm -hmm. retirement community. I mean, a lot of my colleagues want to develop these programs in their district. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same thing with the social adult daycare. We could work together and and really create some good models um, that can serve the senior, that would be great. Well, I think that's why I'm um, sitting here listening to the hearing today. It's really interesting because we're talking in intro 399A, we're talking about data and utilization and collecting that information. And we're also talking about social adult day and making the connection, sitting there talking about how important both of those things are to be able to, plan. you know, we need the data to plan for the future and to think about different kind of models and innovative models and the different services that people will need. And those will change over time. And I know, you know, we had a an event back in, I think, um, in the fall with our membership about kind of the future of senior services. And there was so much excitement in the room about developing innovative services and, um, you know, serving in the success successful ways we're serving seniors now, but also looking to the future and seeing what, what seniors will need. And, you know, we need the data to, to talk about that and we need to look at successful models and different models. And, and I think it's an exciting time because we know that um, the needs are changing and um, that we'll need to keep pace with that and to be actually ahead of it. So I think we'd welcome that. And I think, um, you know, it's, it was a great hearing today to be talking about all these issues at once. Great. Well, thank you again for your great work and thank you thank for you. being here today. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>